Uh, Jennifer. I have, a, have had a terrible aversion to the idea that the insurance companies take on the order of 30% of every dollar we spend. 30 cents out of every dollar in order to support this huge bureaucracy of bills and permission and all that that goes on. I, I heard lately a statistic that just appalled me, and I want to compare it to the local situation here. But uh, Boston, with its fairly large city, Boston General Hospital, has 450 people in the financial accounts office. And Ottawa and Toronto General, about the same size city, same size hospital, has two. <laughs> so now you know where that 30% is going, right? How many financial people do we have in the financial office locally? Um, I, I don't know the exact number, but uh, sure around 20, 10 to 20, something like that. Uh, but, but your point, I believe, is just that uh, we have a huge bureaucratic burden of, uh, in order to take care of all the payers and all the complexity of the system. We do have to employ uh, way more than we would if we had a simplified, more rational payment system. I'd just like to interject. You're right about the 30% number for standard indemnity health insurance, about 30 to 33%. Standard classic Medicare, 3% only. So much uh, I don't, sorry. Keep in mind that that uh, 23 to 31 percent, whatever it is, varying by insurance company, that goes on top of a much higher payment to the provider. So it's not just the 30. I want you to remember that thing that showed you in the case of the hip where it was triple. Big difference. Uh, I, I don't know if this is anyone's question, but I want to be sure to ask because it relates to political action, and, and Steve, it's for you. And the question is, would a well-organized ballot initiative <coughs> help move the single-payer uh, bill along? Uh, no. Well, I'm, I guess I'm showing my bias with initiatives. I mean, I support the initiative process, but if you look at the initiatives that have passed the last few years, in fact, 1351, the classroom size, I've been supported because it's gonna cost us $2 billion over the next four years, $2 billion we don't have, and the dollars, if you really look at the data, within the McCleary sort of definition of, uh, of basic education, we were gonna focus on shrinking class size in kindergarten to third grade, but the data is really solid. That's where class size, small class size is super important, not as much so as you get older, yet 1351 is gonna cause us to deal with it across the spectrum. You look at the marijuana initiative, you look at the liquor initiative. The advantage of initiatives like that is you have a statewide debate, but unless you include a funding mechanism in the initiative, uh, I think they're really, um, you know, they're not helpful. Um, I think as a political strategy, uh, just, you know, I was a little, maybe a little, uh, a little harsh earlier, but uh, Alan Mulally, some of you may know, who was the CEO at Boeing when they were pretty successful and then moved to Ford and was pretty successful there. So he's in, you know, a very rarefied air as far as a CEO. He did a speech in Seattle a couple weeks ago and he had a number of things that I thought were important, but he had one comment that is really, I think, germane to what we're trying to do. He said, you have to keep two thoughts in your mind. You have to keep the vision of where you want to go, but you also have to keep the reality of what, how this, how you get there. And once you develop that strategy, you have to be relentless on executing that strategy. And even though, uh, as Patrick listed, you know, it's an incremental process, and you know, and, and that's our answers at Olympia. And, you know, we're trying to just digest the ACA. Quite frankly, I think there's some truth to that. I mean, if we went to, and you know, we're trying to look at the federal basic health option. And the timeline for that, which has already been agreed to by the legislature is out to 2017, to do the basic actuarial studies and look at um, how do we provide, how do we meld some of these challenges. We're also working on trying to meld behavioral health 
and medical and chemical dependency, so it's no wrong door, so it's seamless. So there's a lot of things going on, and um, that's not to say that if this existed, it would be simpler. It's just that the reality is, is a challenge for where we want to go, and I think it's important to keep those two thoughts in your mind. Yes, yeah, sir. Want to push this no, don't press anybody. No, it's, it's on. Just put it close to your mouth. <clears throat> My name is Rod Marvell, and I live in Scrim, Washington. I was about to say I'm Ronald Reagan, and I think he should go to the emergency room. That's my only smart old comment of the day. I have a question. In the United States military, isn't there a health care system single payer? It's socialist. And the federal penitentiary system and the state jails, aren't the inmates covered by single payer? Okay. That's what I thought, and that is what I try to use when I'm talking to people who are against it. Franklin Roosevelt wanted this system. He also wanted the Bill of Rights, I'm sorry, the GI Bill of Rights for everybody, and he did not get it. Um, <clears throat> but what he did to pay for World War II, besides selling war bonds, Congress raised taxes on wealthy people up to 90%. It stayed over 70% into the 1950s, and under President Eisenhower, it was raised back to 90% again. President Obama has talked about that, but it hasn't gone very far, and it probably won't now. But that's one way to help pay for this. Raise that tax back up, and we know that when the tax on corporations and wealthy people was very high, they did better. They survived economically, and so did the rest of the country. Thank you for tolerating my little speech here. <laughs> would, would anyone like to comment? Ken? Yeah, I, I think you've actually touched on something that's broader than the whole single payer debate, because the fact is, if you look at Predictors of bad health outcomes in populations, infant mortality, teen pregnancy, alcoholism, premature death, you name it, it correlates to income inequality. And we have increasing income inequality in this country, and in many, many ways the healthcare crisis is, is, is a symptom of that rather than a cause. Um, again, I, I'll, I'll do a little lobbying here with the representative sitting there for me and say that if this state would actually rise to the occasion and tax itself and tax income like other states do, we would be able to pay for McCreary, we'd be able to pay for yeah. some repair if we'd have a more just and healthy society. I don't disagree. <laughs> there are an awful lot of rich people on the east side of Seattle. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, Sydney Collins, Fort Townsend. Uh, we, uh, we have the math and we have the logic. It's a matter of, and I won't reiterate a lot, a lot of what I think the Chair has said. Uh, I would add a few things for your consideration. Uh, it used to be, and I think it may still be, that over half of the people employed in this country are employed by small business. Not, and, and they, what they understand, are not our, would not be our opponents. I would add another category to that list of seven, and that is people who are affluent enough to have really good health care plans. And uh, I think they could be reached also. I think there's a rich fellow in Germany one time uh, said, you know, I don't want to be a rich man in a poor country. Uh, uh, Count von Bismarck actually did this in the 1880s in Germany. He realized that a, a healthy people with well-being meant for a strong Germany, a strong country. That's important. Uh, so I think we need to do that uh, as opposed to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Never confuse that with local Chamber of Commerce. There are right-wing outfits. World War I and on. Uh, another thing I think we could do that would help pay for this that I'll, I'll throw in here is, and that's health care. And I'm sorry, I don't regard that we have health care. I'm glad we have excellent surgeons. They make terrible physicians, in my, in my experience. I'm glad they do what they do. We have doctors that know how to heal. Injured, when I'm injured or sick, I want to do that. 
that they're not required in medical school to have anything about nutrition. They generally, there are exceptions, don't regard food as an important thing for human health. You never find a farmer to do that with his stock. We need, we need, so I, I want to comment on this, is why I'm bringing them up. I think these are issues that haven't been covered. Uh, so I, we need to actually train our doctors in health because there would be an efficiency. Just like we can save half of our energy by efficiency in this country, so too we could save perhaps half of our medical costs by getting people healthy. So I wonder what you think about that. I think these are potential. So I'd like to well, well, I don't think there's anybody probably in this room that, is, that feels that we have a health care system. We have an insurance system or a, a you know, dollar distribution system. So there's no, and, I, and we're making better steps along the way. I think the Affordable Care Act has is some advantage to go from you know, fee-based to outcome-based so you do get rewarded and reimbursed if you have better outcomes, people are healthier. But we, I, 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 there's no question we have a lot more to do there. And this is part of this debate between a primary care doctor and a specialist. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, right now, even as the system transitions, you still are reimbursed at a higher rate for a specialty than you are if you're a primary doctor. And that's, that's part of the challenge that we need this would address, but I think we are trying to address through the mechanisms that exist already. Comments on that? I'll just say, um, absolutely need to shift to a focus on population health. Um, and we need our payment system to have rational incentives that push us to help people uh, live health healthier lives and actually improve population health. And the way the incentives are built right now, it, it does not work that way. The incentives are a mess. Um, and that's why you need a simplified uh, single payer system, because you can can't build the incentives, incentives that way. For those of you who may not have noticed, uh, it's after 2.30, which was our closing time. Uh, I see interest, uh, continuing interest. Uh, am I right about that? Because uh, if you are, we need to find out from our panel if they're able to stay for, what, another 20 minutes? Senators and 
representatives and state agencies and the governor's office is represented. And the um, one in four of the people that are turning 65 in Washington have an average of about $25,000 or less. So if you're looking for an in-home care worker at whatever, $500 a week or $1,000 a month, or if you're in an assisted living at $2,000 a month, you, you, know, you do not have the savings to pay for that, for that service, that care. Medicare does not pay for that long-term care. Medicaid will if you spend everything down. Um, but it's questionable. So my point is, this is what they call the age range, the silver tsunami. And the demographics graphics are inexorable. They, we will drown when that wave hits, and the wave is starting to hit. And so this is a huge challenge that we need to figure out. The good news is that 84% of the care is provided by family in home. And there's a lot of effort, Washington's a leader, to try and provide more care in home and aging in place is what they, is how we call it. And strength in that part of the system, we're actually getting a waiver uh, on this community first choice option, which expands what we do for in-home care. Um, and we're actually gonna net some dollars that will help strengthen the system statewide. But it's only a short-term fix probably for this biennium. And it, it is a huge challenge. I mean, there's folks that are talking to me about initiating a payroll tax just for long-term care. And a funding mechanism for this trust would be a payroll tax. So there is some synergy there. Um, and I saw, I'm interested also that that is part of that because there is a huge need. The other part of it is um, the baby boomers, so I am one. Um, they are requiring more care. That cohort between 65 or 60, 65 to 75, 80 requires more care than the people that are 75 to 85. And for those of you that live in the 60s, you might have some answers for why that is. But, <laughs> but no, there are, there's chemical issues, chemical dependency issues, there's poor health, there's just a sense of, you know, not, you know, not planting not taking care of it. And so this, this is a challenge, and I think that's one of the strengths of a trust that would incorporate a long-term care component. Um, and and uh, so I think it's a really good point. Uh, Ken, do you want to respond to that in terms of single-payer? Well, the only, the only thing that's relevant there is that, um, again, if we had a health system that actually paid doctors to spend time with their patients and to done, do long-term care planning, do end-of-life planning and, and management, the, the savings are, are incredible, but it's incredibly time-consuming. Uh, in my career, I, I found that one of the most rewarding things I do is to sit down with, with, with someone, let's say with a terminal diagnosis, and talk about utilization. I mean, the system is all primed to squeeze every dime and procedure out of people until the moment they stop breathing. And people find it liberating to know that they don't really have to play that game necessarily if we can get the proper support mechanisms in place. People are a lot more worried about dying alone and dying in pain than they are uh, missing out on one more round of chemo. <laughs> uh, again, I'm gonna, this is, this is, this is an interesting question, and maybe one of yours, so forgive me if it is. Uh, somebody is quoting Don McCann in his daily quote on October 26th. Quote is, none of us will see single payer if we confine our activities to our respective states. None of us will see single pay. In other words, we're not going to see it if it's on a state by state basis. So, could I have to this question and have a response to that? Patrick? Obviously, from my remarks, I couldn't disagree with that more strongly. Uh, I think what he means is that, let's say we pass this and the referendum process starts within 30 days and big money comes at us, uh, like another tsunami, so to speak. 
that's when we have to add another state or two at our side to defend that. I think that's where Don's coming from on that, on that, on that question. Other, other than that, uh, I couldn't disagree with them more strongly. Any other comments on that in terms of strategy? Um, the way Canada got prepared, it was done province by province. Um, the way we got, you know, the way uh, legalizing gay marriage is happening state by state, uh, marijuana legalization is going that way. I think it's a great way in this country to affect change and going state by state. Okay. Um, sir, your question or your comment? Yeah, my name is Brian Drag. I live in Squint and I happen to be a member of the Wuhan chapter. I just want to say it's a wonder that old Nag Bosanay hasn't bubbled yet, keeps stumbling forward, and the old man in the south, Don Quixote, can still look up at the next window that's coming his way. And so I want to thank you all for coming along for the ride. And what I have to say to Representative Thuringer is this. The forces aligned against these windmills that we are looking at. We know it's big money. We know the insurance companies are the predominant people that are going to stand in the way of a single payer system. Everything is inextricably linked to the power of corporations and big money. Move on last year worked with WAMEN on an initiative 1329 to get our state our, our, our federal legislators to acknowledge this and to basically pledge to support a 28th Amendment which would state that corporations are not people and that money is not the same as free speech. This next year we're going to be launching a campaign that's aimed directly at the state legislature, okay, that's going to ask the state to get on board to fight big money as exemplified by the Citizens United decision. We cannot begin to move forward on so many other issues until we enlist the support of all progressive organizations and legislators, and you're one of them who signed on board acknowledging that Citizens United needed to be overturned. And so my question to you is, will you actively engage with this upcoming campaign and support it, and also encourage your fellow legislators to do the same? which will in turn help this other movement forward and all other progressive causes forward. Steve. Yeah, well, I, as you said, I signed on before, so I totally agree with you, and yeah, I will support um, I, you know, it's part of the rabbit hole we're in that folks think that corporations are people and money is speech. I mean, it's, like I said, you know, we live in a you know a market economy, and I think a lot of us would agree that there's some advantage to that. It generates you know a lot of innovation, but we don't want to live in a market society. And that's not my quote. That's from this. Uh, I think his name is John Sindel, who, wrote, who teaches this justice program in at Harvard and, and put out a book on on the market, the morality or lack of morality in the market. And I think that's our challenge. Um, and you know when you look at education and the sort of the metrics that are driving education, that's to privatize education. And you look at healthcare, you know the market drives a lot of what we're talking about. And 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 there are certain things, in my view, that are more the moral imperative says that shouldn't be a market. That's more of a moral human issue, not a market issue. But there's a lot of challenges. I'll just give you one example. Um, Mental health issues. There is, you know, I, when I was a commissioner, I represented the, the regional support network, and we really worked hard to maintain local control. And in this rollout that's going on, um, you know, with combining those, we worked on doing that. Pierce County has a private mental health delivery system, Optum, and they and I have talked with a couple of the representatives down there. I said, this is ludicrous. Why are we paying Optum? four, six percent off the top in profit to provide mental health services for Pierce County. And the representative said to me, well, they have really good outcomes. And so they deserve a certain amount of return profit for those really good outcomes. 
But sort of if you drill down, a lot of their more difficult cases, they send to the state hospital. They don't deal with it. But to this guy, to this representative, and he's a voice in the legislature, he thinks this is the answer. So it's again, you know, um, be careful of the windmill you chase and look at this, you know, the drilling down and making the argument to the folks that need to have their minds changed. Hi, I'm Margie Whitmore, and I'm a member of the Clapham County League, and I live in Squibb. And my question is to any on the panel who can tell me if they know the position of the Catholic-owned health care centers, if they will support WISP. If you know what they're, if you've taken a read on their opinion. Um, I've only taken a read um, in casual conversations uh, with, um, some people that were in the <laughs> province and they were high ranking and um, they were in favor of it in a, at a personal level. Um, I don't know if they, if Providence um, has a statement at the, uh, you know, at the organizational level, um, but uh, I think that's another great route, you know, for kind of changing minds, you know, because uh, you would expect well, would the Catholic to be an obvious system. moral fit. Yeah. Absolutely. So I think somebody should take action and go and challenge them and ask them, you know, and uh, so I encourage that question to be asked if it's not answered. Is anyone else aware of the sense of that? On the surface, Providence would always tell you that they support single payer. They're very supportive of the American Hospital Association. In fact, Rich Undenstock, who used to be at Sacred Heart in Spokane, mm -hmm. is the president of the American Hospital Association, and they're one of the strongest lobbies against it. But I, against it. But I mean, that's part of what you need to, we need to make transparent, you know? It's yeah. like you need to challenge that so that people's actual stance and corporations and organizations' actual stance is revealed, and that's part of getting the conversation going. I didn't mean to shock you by that. It's that yeah, awesome. They're one of the most active lobbies in Washington, and they do oppose it. They kind of like the way that the gravy train is running right now. Yeah, it's still follow the money, isn't it? Yeah, sure. I'm so sorry. So the Washington State Hospital Association <laughs> has a statement opposing. Is that what you're saying? Okay, go ahead. So the Washington okay. State Hospital Association also favors single payer on the surface. You can't find any activity that supports it in their uh, part of the American Hospital Association. So you look at who's got lobbyists in Washington, uh, they're on the other side. Hi, my name is Ellen Fetchett, and I'm from Port Angeles, Washington. I too am a member of the Clown County, <coughs> but mostly I'm still a full time employee. I'm going to work until I die. Anyway, um, Thank all of you for for all kinds of things that you've given us today. Um, I loved hearing about New Zealand, the other states, the PowerPoint there. Um, Steve, thanks for being our representative. I'm glad to have known you so long. And I think we are so lucky, and I don't know that people really know that. So, um, my next, actually, I, I was stimulated as, as Patrick and, and Matt were talking. So these are my comments, kind of questions, comments, and ideas for all of us to think about maybe. So for Patrick, um, I wanted to know if you've spoken to the PA business group that meets at Joshua's on, I think it's Tuesday morning. And do I have the right Port group? Port Angeles yeah, yeah. business group. If not, I think that'd be a good idea. And then how about the PA City Council? Even the, the PowerPoint or excerpts or aspects of it and round the rest of us up to be there when you're there. And the PA business owners. So I've those asked, are my questions. I've asked that I've been put off, but I'm re really hopeful I'm going to get in front of them. I always tend to not like getting in front of a whole room full of businessmen, but I'm quite willing to do it. Okay, so I know some people that would go and be there. Please see me afterward. No, I don't fight for right. doing that. I so would, I'd I would like to challenge us as league people to get some support to be present for that, <coughs> especially the healthcare people. 
um, to begin part of the education that is so critically needed. I think what you gave us is really a guideline if all of us would get into it, pay attention and learn that, and develop our elevator speeches. That would be awesome, because okay. we can move forward. Um, for Matt, when I look at you, I think about our son, who's 29, and the conversations we've had since this last election. And then also seen in the paper that 36%, I think, is the number of the people in our country voted. And I saw a statistic that of something like 17% of the, the 20 to 34, 21 to 34 year olds voted. So what I was thinking about is how cool it would be for people like you who look young, and whether or not you are, and whether or not, again, the rest of us to start doing something to have real dialogue about these, these concrete problems that those kids face, um, you know, to do some education through the schools or whatever. Anyway, I'd love to have any of you a part of that, and I think we should think about doing that, aren't you? Thank you. Well, Matt. Yeah, the conversations we've had at home are yeah. that why why can why bother? And I think we need to help them understand why they want to bother. It's uh, it's really hard. I was really cynical about politics um, for a very long time, and just uh, because I just found it so frustrating that it seemed to be just so controlled by money. And it, it, there's money um, is a cancer in our political system, and you know, young people see this and they just see why even bother. You know, exactly. if you're not a multi, you know, million dollar or billion dollar corporation, you don't have the power. Um, so it's hard to change that mindset. And it, and I would say, and I was gonna, yeah, I would say to anyone who wants political change, um, you can have political change. It's really, really hard, but you just have to be willing to make yourself uncomfortable. And there's all sorts of tactics you can do to make political change, and you have to think what will um, what will actually have an impact. You know, you can, I mean, you can write a letter, you can donate a little money, but you can also go and speak in front of a you know an elected body. You can run for office. Um, you can protest. These are all tactics that are worth doing um, in any political type of change you want to happen. And I think in single payer healthcare, I think they're all on the table. Um, and so anyone, uh, young or old, that wants to change something, make a list of potential actions you could take, and then mark which, you know, rank them in order of what makes you the most uncomfortable. Because I guarantee the ones that make you uncomfortable are probably the ones that will actually do the most. And they'll actually energize you. And you'll feel the change, you'll feel the impact, and you'll be inspired to do more, and, and you'll feel inspired to keep going with it. So, so that's what I would say. If you want young people to come out and support this issue, then do a march. You know, do something that is physical, well, and young people, you know, they tend to like really more substantive action. Absolutely, I agree with that. But I think people like you who are doing something real and are visual and know metaphors and can present information in a great way need to be having the conversation. It's up to the rest of us to make that possible. I, I go anywhere I'm invited. So, <laughs> invite me, I'll go on. Okay. My name is Rick Girardi. I'm a physician, <coughs> uh, trained in Boston in pediatrics and medicine. The only reason I tell you the background, then for a lot of further training at Stanford and a life tenure member at the University of Rochester, involved in regional medical programs, and I support fully everything that's been said here about the inequity, about the overhead costs, of, 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 and the public per personal anguish of doing things the way we have both for physicians and for patients. I wanted to ask if you could just complete the thread that you started in terms of single-payer intrusion already in the US, that is veterans, uh, Medicare, and on and on. And really, if we look at people who are under insured, not insured, um, how many does that leave who really are, we're talking about, who aren't 
in a situation where they're not uh, being supported by this whole wasteful system. You have numbers? Did you have those numbers again? Well, my understanding is that even after the Affordable Care Act is fully implemented, there will be upwards of 30 million uninsured right. in the United States. So we take them off at 320 million right. plus. No, but what I'm saying is, how many, then if you take veterans off, if you take government workers off, on and on and on, what are you left with as a residual that we're really talking about in, in terms of additional single payer? Well, I can't work them backwards. I mean, right now, I think it's 45 million uninsured. I mean, that, so those, I have to assume those people don't have anything, either employer based or government based or whatever. 60% of the dollars go through our government. Sixty percent of the whole pie. Right. right. So that's dollars, not people. It's dollars. private and dollars. insurance. But bear in mind, the government absorbs the cost of end of life care and geriatric care through Medicare, which is well, right. Expensive. And the, that sixty percent is all the most expensive people. The insurance takes care of the employed and healthy people. Remember, our government is paying for the military, so the people who've been blown up, the veterans who've been blown up, the uh, you know Medicare. That's, that's the argument for single parents. No cherry picking, no decisions. Okay. No I, I, well, just, just in summary, it's a small residual, really, probably no more than 30 or 40 percent that we're really talking about. And that ought to be uh, brought up in more public As a strategy. Uh, how quickly can you make your I have a quick <coughs> question. I'm one of uh, three generations of uh, family practitioners. And my question is this. Most of us don't want to reinvent the wheel. So out of the top 10 countries in Europe or wherever that have the best healthcare outcomes, which of the top three would you suggest we model our program after so we can look those up and we can develop our own little three-minute elevator speeches and promotions? Mm. All right. Great. I don't think we have to go any further than Canada. They even use our name. They took Medicare from us. I mean, <laughs> so I mean, it, it works. The same, basically, the same population demographic, the same continent. I mean, just let's do Canada, and all the information you hear that people are unhappy with with the Canadian health system is baloney. I mean, it's 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 the people who come down here because they don't want to wait for their hip or it's inconvenient, it's not over the holidays, whatever. But. And there was a funding problem about seven or eight years ago that's been rectified. People are very happy with their system. Yeah, so. yeah and I would, if you, if you haven't read TRE's book, Healing of America, it, he goes through and looks at five or six different countries. And the one I think is quite interesting is Taiwan, because they just, they had passed the national referendum that said we want national health care in the 90s, and then they went out and formed, you know, the most current model which is pretty close to Canada, but I think the payment schedule, they don't call it a tax, they call it a premium, an insurance premium that everybody pays, and they think the, the optics of that are better. But I, that, I would, anybody who's interested in this issue, I think that's just a fabulous book on this. It's T-R-E, R-E-I-T, -E, uh, The Healing of America. I attended a, a reunion of my family uh, in Victoria several years ago, and there were about 75 of them there. They were unanimous. That's what they wanted to talk to me about was our healthcare system. Uh, yeah, they wait sometimes for, for things that aren't important, but gosh, if they've got something that triages, uh, they're in there tomorrow. Uh, they were unanimous in their praise of their healthcare system. They're proud of it. All right, and I'm going to give my mic I'll be very quick. Dee, do you realize that the Jefferson County Democrats passed a resolution on Tuesday specifically asking the Jefferson Health Care Commissioners and our legislators, state legislators, to actively support the Washington Health Security Trust Single Payer Act? Uh, no, I wasn't aware that you had passed that, but um, certainly I could support that. Oh, good. I'm glad to hear that. We need co-sponsors. Are you willing to co-sponsor? 
Yes. Great. I noticed that uh, I looked at your website and I noticed that my name was on there, so I don't know what happened. <laughs> I'm on the bill. I mean, whatever it is. Uh, I just let me. It's great. There's a lot of people here from Squim and Port Angeles and Clown and Jefferson County. That's fabulous. That uh, you know, that's all the 24th district. But that's great that you folks are engaged in this across the peninsula. That's thanks for coming. Thank you. Thanks for the comment. All right. Uh, what I want to do is ask the question. You know, the post test question. Please raise your hand if you feel you have a better understanding of single payer after this. Well, well that feels pretty good, doesn't it? Um, how about ACA? <laughs> yeah, okay, two people got a little more. Okay, that's great. If you have, I want to echo what uh, Steve has said and honor it. You have, you are, Okay, let's uh, thank our panel for this.